I'm Niloufar Salehi. I'm an assistant professor at UC Berkeley. Um, I teach computer science, human computer interaction, and human centered AI. My guest today is Niloufar Salehi. Niloufar is an assistant professor in the School of Information at the University of California, Berkeley. He studies human computer interaction with her research spanning education to healthcare to restorative justice. Her research interests are social computing, human centered AI, and more broadly, human computer interaction, or HCI. Her work has been published and received awards in Premier of the News and has been covered in Venture Beat, Wired, and The Guardian. She's a WT Grant Foundation Scholar for her work on promoting equity in student assignment algorithms and is a member of the Advisory Board on Generative AI at NVDA. She received her PhD in Computer Science from Stanford University in 2018. In this episode, Niloufar shares her inspiring journey into human-computer interaction, reflects on the field's evolution over the years and the interaction between the corporate world and academia. We delve into her dual expertise in UX and AI, the topics of her research and the critical role of product managers in responsible tech development. Stick around for personal insights, audience questions, and Niloufar's advice for product managers aspiring to dive into AI. Let's get started. Welcome to Product Perspectives, the podcast for product people that gives a voice to their stakeholders, hosted by Magali Pellissier. Each weekly episode shows you the other side of the product with interviews of the people who contribute to making products a success. They are engineers, writers, marketers, support analysts, UX designers, or even salespeople. Not only will they get the credit they deserve, but they will share their perspectives on what makes a good product and product manager. Stakeholder management is a key skill for product managers. So just as you're obsessed with listening to your customers, let's hear from your stakeholders. Welcome, Niloufar. I'm so happy to have you today because we've talked a few times in the past and uh, I think there's a wealth of experience that you've got and I, I would love for you to share with our listeners. So thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Great. So we'll start first with your background. So can you share your journey into the field of human computer interaction? Yes, happy to. So I started off being very much into programming and computer science. I got my bachelor's in computer science. And while I was doing that, I loved the sort of problem solving aspect of programming. I was really into puzzles, but I also felt a need for a connection between that and human beings and what people do, because I was also fascinated by that world. So I started off um, talking to different people who were doing research. I got interested in neuroscience research and modeling the brain. That was sort of my intro into bringing together humans and computers. And from there, I learned about human computer interaction. And I was really fascinated because of the interdisciplinary nature of the field, the fact that we got to both build things and build technology, which was always my passion, but at the same time to really study and understand humans and, and the socio-technical aspects of technology um, and sort of think about how can we build technology that is actually useful and good for people. And the field really brought those two passions together in a way that made me really excited. So that's the area that I got my PhD in. Great. And I think that may also answer one of the questions that listeners may have already. Why are you on that podcast? What brings you and product managers close together? And one of the first elements of answers that we've got is that passion for understanding better the humans, which for us are the users. Um, having deep empathy for them and building things that uh, are good for, for for society. 
So now you are an experienced professional when you finished your PhD in human computer interaction, that was back in 2018. Do you think that things have changed in this field since? And if so, what? Yes, very much. So in order to answer that question, let me give you a brief history of the field of human computer interaction because everyone might not know it. So the field really came out of a need to understand how to design for human beings as soon as computers started entering workplaces. So before that, computers were these ginormous rooms that people who were programmers used them to do computation. And then as soon as they started entering the workforce, first through very early versions like the Xerox machine and then through personal computers, people started to understand that we really need to design with human needs in mind. And that's sort of another parallel with what product managers do today. Um, the field sort of came out of this first steps of designing the graphical user interface was HCI research, designing the mouse, um, designing collaborative software, like what we now use, like the Google Docs. All of those came out of HCI research. More recently, and especially in the last five years, I think some big changes have been, first and foremost, the emphasis on AI and machine learning. And there's a really interesting parallel between AI and HCI. Um, some people say that whenever there's an Whenever there is an advancement in AI, it's followed by a lot of hype. After a while, or at least so far, it's been the case where the hype was not exactly completely met and people understood that they need to refocus on human needs. So every time there's an AI winter, there's sort of a boom in HCI research or UX or trying to better understand people and their needs. Um, because of the really big advancements in AI now, there's been increased emphasis and um, sort of a subfield emerging of human-centered AI, which is one of the areas that I do research in and teach. Um, the, the second big change is similar advancements in other kinds of technologies like AR, VR, uh, wearables, things that for the longest time were sort of early HCI prototypes, like how do we project an interface onto someone's body or the space or those kinds of things, we now have the technology that is getting much, much better. And so that's another big change. And the third thing, which I think is also a reflection of the, the social and the political things going on in the world is an increased uh, emphasis on ethical design, bias mitigation, sustainability, privacy, data security, those kinds of areas, which are very important. Yes. Definitely, as a product manager, I can definitely sense the, the increase in um, concerns around ethics and taking that into account in, in the product. And that's even more relevant now that we collect so much data and are going to use this e data in, in AI models. Right. I, I'm, I'm smiling already because... Um, I have that little game in my head where I count the number of times the term AI is mentioned and I think you're going to smash it. <laughs> <laughs> so I've stopped like counting, me. but you're going to be a winner of all of those. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for a good reason, not for the hype thing, for, for actual good reasons. Um, so talking about this, so since 2023, so that's quite recent, uh, you are a member of the advisory board on generative AI for NVDA. What exactly do you do in this role? That sounds so exciting. Yeah, so um, I'm really excited about this role. It's a group of academics uh, working together with NVIDIA Research, trying to understand what are the re most recent advances in the field and how does that impact what NVIDIA does, both in research and the technologies that they put out. Um, so one of the areas that I'm really excited about is Mimo Guardrails, which is an open source toolkit for figuring out ways to add guardrails to LLM-based um, conversational applications. The basic idea is that with large language models and a lot of the generative AI, you really have very limited control over what the model produces. And for a lot of real world applications, you do need to add on some controls. For instance, output controls, like you don't want the model putting out things that are illegal, copyrighted, harmful in any way. And I'm also really interested in input guardrails. So is it okay to make the model sort of a free for all so that users can put anything in it? Or do we put in some guardrails to stop um, unethical use or um, maybe even change 
um, prompts a little bit to figure out things like how to mitigate biases, which is what a lot of companies are doing right now. And so this control of input and outputs to generative AI models is something that I'm really interested in as a research area, because I think it's going to be really, really important um, and is one of the things that NVIDIA is working on right now. Good. So my takeaway from, from all of that is the initial intention, which is almost like bridging the gap between the corporate world and academia, because there's so many fantastic work that researchers like you are doing and that companies can leverage. And I know that this is the reason we initially met because you were interested in, in learning more from, from product managers in the field and what other things that are happening. Yeah, oh, that's my cat. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, so you've got a double specialty, right? With uh, human computer interaction, it's more like UX focused and then AI. So how do the two really complement each other? Yeah, so it's really interesting for me that these two have come together now because about 10 years ago when I was applying to grad schools, I got into both AI and HCI programs because I was really interested in both. I, As an undergrad, I was the TA for a graduate level AI class. I was just really fascinated by that world as well. I ended up going into HCI because I felt like that was where the harder problems at the time were. Um, the AI was still not as good as it is now. Um, and now I feel like the two have come together again where we're at this point where the AI got really, really good. And now we need to figure out how to actually make it safe and useful. And that's where the HCI comes in. Um, I will say that, and it's funny that you said, you know, you count how many times people say AI. Whenever possible, I actually avoid saying that word. <laughs> um, and the reason is that I think there's a whole lot of misunderstanding and hype around that specific word. But one way that I, especially for myself and for my students, I try to think about it is, what if instead of AI, we called it statistical pattern recognition or a pattern synthesis engine? This idea that this is something that is very, very different from human cognition, it's large scale pattern recognition. and then you can start to think about, okay, that's actually really cool. And thinking about where the future of making this pattern synthesis engine actually useful requires a whole lot of HCI methodologies to discover you know, and solve meaningful problems, create meaningful data sets, design interactions, think about privacy and safety, and those are all human problems. And so that's where I think the two come together for me is how do we apply machine learning or pattern synthesis in practical human-centered ways. And that's where you know my HCI background and skills come in. Right, and I think that's a good thing because sometimes we tend to be carried away with like technology and all of this is super exciting. And then we have to find a problem to our solution. So it's bringing back the user, the human um, at the center of the process. Exactly. So you've already given some small examples of uh, research, but what are the key areas of focus of your research at the moment? Is there a particular project that you can discuss um, with us? Yeah, definitely. So let's see, sorry. Uh, I got distracted by something, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but I'll get into it again. No problem. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so one of the areas that my lab has been working on, and again, it's all in this area of how do we put the human at the center of these AI problems has been machine translation. So um, we started off by looking at machine translation in part because it's one of the AI tools that has been around for over a decade at this point. It's used a lot in the real world. And so we can start to see over time, and especially as it actually gets embedded in work practice, what the challenges are. Um, we started to look at translation in the context of health, because that's one of the areas where it's used a lot, you know, in hospitals to translate when a patient does not speak the dominant language of that place and where a lot of the challenges come up. So one of the things that we learned really early on is that almost all of the clinical settings, hospitals in the area where I am in California, um, use machine translation a lot to speak to patients who don't speak English. But some basic evaluations showed that almost 20% of those common medical phrases get mistranslated to Chinese. 
and around 8% get mistranslated in a way that causes significant clinical harm. And so we've been working on how do we introduce interventions to make this safer to be used in this kind of an environment. Some of the work that we've done so far is developing a secondary, and this is closer to the guardrails work that I was interested in, creating a secondary model that is sort of a quality estimation on the first model that sort of alerts you if it's not sure about the output of the translation. And we found that when we showed physicians this extra information, it made them about twice better at deciding whether to rely on a machine generated translation or not. The other things that we're working on are sort of finding a balance between using purely trained models and using pattern recognition. So the idea is that if you just use pattern recognition, so not statistical pattern recognition, just uh, def definite pattern recognition, what happens is that you're 100% of the time correct because you're only looking at, for instance, phrases and sentences that you already know how to translate. The other end of the spectrum is if you use purely trained machine learning. Um, there, you are getting higher quality translations, but it's not as reliable because you don't you have no information about whether it's correct or not. What we've been working on is finding a middle ground where you have the flexibility that you would have with a machine with a machine learning model where you can input anything. It doesn't have to be in the library. And the reliability that you get from using a pattern recognition on an existing library. And we find that if you use a mix of these two approaches, you actually get some of the benefits of both. You get the flexibility and you get the reliability. And so these are some of the technical interventions that we've been working on for machine translation in these kinds of high stakes situations. Yeah, I think reliability is key to that from your second example. And the, the first one blew my mind when you mentioned it the first time to me, because as a product manager, it's always good to be reminded that when you put a product out there, people will use it in ways that you hadn't thought about, that weren't intended. And that's exactly what's happening here with using translation tools for a medical <laughs> use case, which wasn't planned for. And I think this is something that we're gonna see more and more with AI technology. And the first evidence I've got of that is how many people have tried to break chat GPT? <laughs> um, that's exactly what people um, are doing right now. And uh, it can be very harmful that those numbers you gave uh, and saying that it can actually cause medical harm. You know, going back to so the, the ethical uh, concerns we should have, um, yeah, it, it could be absolutely dramatic. That is absolutely correct. So I've actually worked with the translate team at Google and the kinds of use cases that they have in mind or they had in mind when they were developing it is things, the ways that they would use it. So if I'm traveling and I use it to translate a menu, for instance, and it's actually really good at those things. But as you're saying, you never know how people are gonna end up actually using the technology. And it's really, really useful if you're doing rounds at a hospital and you quickly wanna get information from a patient or give them some critical information. So people end up using it in those high stakes settings. And some of the times, and this, this is actually a pattern that happens a lot with machine learning, is that because it's statistical, it's unpredictable. And we humans don't really understand that. So we're used to seeing, you know, a car working well in Los Angeles will probably work just as well in San Francisco. And that's how we're used to thinking about things because we're not used to using statistical models that much. But when we talk to physicians, actually one of the things that they said is that a lot of the times it's the patients who bring out Google Translate because they've been using it to order food or you know get directions or other kinds of things and, and it's been working really well for them. So they expect it to work well here as well. Whereas medical language is very, very different from day-to-day -day language. And um, that's where one of the issues is, is that we're not really good at extrapolating from some examples that work well into what other domains may or may not work well, in part because we don't have any idea about what the training data was. So it's not really our fault, but it is a challenge that product managers have to be really careful about. Yeah. I like the reference to personas as well, because you'd think that the, physici the physicians use this to translate to patients, but it's actually the patients themselves who are saying, hey, can we use the translation tool? Um, yeah. And that may be 
I think sometimes we call them uh, indirect personas or like shadow personas. People like this who, you know, we didn't consider they, they weren't the ones supposed to be using the product and they, they bring it. Um, so very exactly. interesting. Right, so there is another tool that you're working on. And yeah. I know because you've given me the output of that tool. So let's talk a bit about that. So I'm gonna explain what I've asked you. So you said to me, okay, um, some product managers are struggling with competitor analysis that takes a lot of time, that's a lot of data and all of that. Um, so we've got this tool, which one of the use cases is gathering information about your competitors. So you asked me, can you give me a list of your competitors? And I looked at my job at Cisco and I was like, but it's very complicated and that's probably going to be very boring for the audience to think about all the networking and the internet and routers and all of that. So I consider my podcast and because I know when I did my own competitor analysis, but there are more than 70 podcast about product or building product entrepreneurship and all of that in English language alone. And I basically stopped doing the competitive analysis after five of them because there was just too much work to do. So I thought, great. Um, so I gave you that list um, and then you sent back to me so like a spreadsheet which had the list of all the competitors in terms of columns, lots of characteristics around number of episodes, no, uh, the frequency of release, the topic, including some grouping. So you know, topics about entrepreneurship, things around more like um, personal development. And then I said to you, well, it's good, but that's still a lot of data. So thank you for almost extracting that data, um, but that's still a lot for me to start through. Um, and then, so you came up with an analysis where I could see the, the distribution. So for example, some of the insights I got from that is that the, the top rated podcasts are usually like a bit shorter, um, which is in line with what um, I had seen. And that's why my podcast is around 35 minutes. Uh, there's some other insights around like the is there any correlation between the, the rating of a podcast and the frequency? I would say, yes, they tend to be like more frequent. Um, so that kind of things. And I found it very useful. That saves me a lot of time, but can you tell me a bit more behind the scene, what that tool is and what you're working on? Yes, definitely. So this is work that we're working on with my lab right now, super excited about it. So we've been thinking a lot about what are things that these models, let's call them pattern recognition models, um, do well? And the things that they do really, really well is synthesize information. And that's really interesting because it's a really good complement to what we humans do well. So um, as you said, going through lots and lots of data and putting it into the structured format would take hours and hours and hours for a human being to do. The models can do it really quickly. Um, categorizing things and summarizing them again is something the models do really well. And so that's an area of my research where we're trying to figure out how do we take this unstructured data around 90% of any organization or company's data is actually unstructured. And how do we turn that into insight insights and actionable things and objectives that directly relate to the kinds of decisions that people are trying to make. And so the competitive analysis that we did for you is one example of that. Another example is um, a journalist who had who was writing a story. They had about 300 to 500 emails coming out of a FOIA request. And they told me that they were just going to ignore the emails because it would take their staff way too long to actually go through and read the emails and see if there was anything that was in any way related to the story. But we ran it through the system. We did something we call a recursive summarization, where it's kind of like the categorization that we did for you, where it took all of the emails and put them into categories where you could see the high level category and you could see that it has three branches. You can go down into the branches and see what else is in these emails. Um, they found a lot of interesting things that actually did end up going into the story that they didn't know why, why it was there and it solved some of the questions that they had. And so that's an area that I'm really, really interested in. It's both a technical machine learning question and it's an HCI and UX question because you need to make it so that 
the outputs are reliable, you can point back to where they come from. And also they need to be usable by people. Um, this is also going into another area of research that I've worked on that I'm really interested in called no code analysis or low code analysis, where you don't really have to write the code in order to be able to analyze these data sets. You just need to understand what the person is trying to get out or what insights or questions they have. And so that's an area that I'm actively doing research on. And I am looking for other people who want to try out the system. So if any of your listeners want to try it out for competitive analysis, for pulling out pain points from users, for any of those sort of questions where you have lots of unstructured data, um, I would be happy to help them. Yes, I'm sure people are going to be super interested because they realize oh, when was the last time I did competitive analysis? <laughs> and I can tell you that it was probably a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so another thing I'm really interested in, um, and I've been teaching um, you know, UX design, HCI for five years now at Berkeley. A lot of my students have gone on to become product managers at big companies. I'm trying to understand where the biggest pain points are related to, you know, gathering insights from unstructured information. So uh, we are running a survey. It's, it's a pretty short survey. Um, I'll share the link with you. If you could share with your audience, that would be great. Um, and one of the things we're trying to understand is what are those biggest areas where people have these challenges? And um, we will share back the results to people who do this survey as well. Yes, definitely. I think, I think product managers, they solve problems for their users but they have problems themselves and sometimes it, it feels good to to be heard so I'm sure lots of people will want to share that with you especially if you share back the results at the end um, yes I will definitely share that survey thank you so talking about um, product managers because you said well a lot of your students are now product managers you also somehow activate like a product manager you know creating those products yeah uh, so let's talk about, I think, um, what you see as the role of product managers in ensuring that the technology they develop is responsible, um, uh, they do it responsibly and thinking about being inclusive and all that. How can product managers be better at that, play a more active role? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. In my class, um, one of the things that we do throughout the semester is that students basically develop a product. So they go and do interviews with their target audience. They start to prototype, they test. And one of the sessions that we have, one of the weeks in the semester is on um, ethical analysis of the, the product that they're building. One of the techniques that we use is this website called the Tarot Cards of Tech. I'll share the link with you. Um, it's a deck of cards and on each one of them, there's a question about the potential negative or harmful impacts of technology. So what the students do is they pick three of those cards and they apply it to their own product or the thing that they're building for the class. And then they have to do an analysis of, first of all, how could that be harmful? So some examples are, say you're producing software that is gonna be used in hiring. Um, bias and discrimination would be one of those things. So there are cards related to specific questions that you might ask about those harms. Another is accessibility, for instance. And so what they have to do is not only say how that harm might happen through their product, but also to say what steps they would take if they had another semester to work on that, where they would actually go towards mitigating that harm. And the first step is always engaging with the users who would be harmed the most. Um, so that's one way to think about it is you know, doing the really, really hard work of interrogating your own system. You know, whenever we build something, we tend to get really, really attached to it. But doing this interrogation, sometimes external tools or um, sort of cognitive scaffolds like the um, tarot cards of tech can help us ask the really hard questions. And then the next step is how do we engage with the people who would be the people who would be harmed by this? And how do we mitigate that harm? How do we, you know, if the harm has already happened, how do we work towards repairing the harm? I think specifically with newer technologies, there's also a lot that we don't know yet about how they might harm people. Um, one example of this is location tracking. I remember, um, I was speaking to someone who worked at Google who I was I was talking about this harm of you know d people who are victims of domestic violence um and being tracked by through location tracking 
And he was saying, well, when we were developing the technology, we had no idea that this was going to happen. How are we supposed to know? And I thought, well, for one thing, he's right. Um, but for another, if if you spoke to anyone who was a victim of domestic violence and you told them that such a technology was being produced, they could tell you immediately how it would harm them. Um, and so I think that's a place where we really, really have to understand that certain users have expertise that we do not have, or like you're saying, secondary users, even maybe people who aren't directly our customers um, have expertise that we have do not have and engaging them earlier can lead to uh, mitigating a lot of those harms. Yeah. And I think it comes to also having a, a diverse team, right? Because it may be, I don't know the stats, but I know that the, the, the number of victims of domestic uh, abuse is actually quite high. So there's a likelihood you could have somebody like this. And they may, that's not a protected character. So you wouldn't know about the person. We don't also collect that data, you know, when you work in a company, uh, but having a diverse team could help. Um, exactly. Yeah, spot those things. There is something else in the that tarot game that you said. Uh, I like the fact that it it is somehow gamified a bit because sometimes as a product manager we are super busy, and somebody brings, oh, have you thought about accessibility? Have you thought about diversity? And all of that, and you're like, oh, <laughs> another thing to think about. So the gamification side of it. It just brings it, you know, <laughs> in a in a nicer way, in a more engaging way that you actually want to spend time thinking about this. And I think it would be a very good um, thing to do, not just as PMs, but also with UX designers, of course, with developers, thinking about maybe bringing marketing to some of those conversations because that impacts the way they position the product. Um, so yeah, I like that. I will definitely share exactly. the link as well. Yes, yeah, so I shared the link with you. I think you're you're completely right. It's the gamification. It's that it's tangible. It has nice pictures on it, and it's something that you could bring the, exactly all of the team together and spend an afternoon on, and really dive deep into questions that you're right on a regular basis where you're dealing with a million other things. It's hard to you know have the headspace for. But if you intentionally set aside time and bring the team together around an activity like the tarot cards of tech, that can be really useful. Great. So one other thing that product managers have to think about is how they got to how they can prepare to be ready for the future. So what are the trends that you see for the future in the um, human computer interaction and AI space that could impact product development? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think we're sort of moving past the initial bump of hype that came from chat GPT and we're starting to get closer to okay how do people actually get value out of these things and um, I think a lot of that comes from what some people call human AI collaboration or some people don't like that word because it sort of makes the human and the AI look like they're at the same level the AI is really a tool so thinking about how do people use this well in their workflow I think that's a future trend that we're going forward towards. Even yesterday, Sam Altman said something like, oh, we're going to have, you know, more specialized models for specialized things that people need to do. Um, and so in that sense, for product managers focusing more on the, the classics, thinking about mental models, interactive machine learning, what are the goals of my user and how can this statistical pattern recognition tool help them achieve those goals? Um, to sort of augment their capabilities in achieving those goals in a way that is intuitive and user-friendly. Um, I think that's the future trend that we're gonna see over the next few years as more and more of these tools actually become useful. I think we're also gonna have a lot of misses. Um, so already we're seeing, there's this really good uh, podcast slash newsletter that I like called AI Snake Oil, where they talk about things that people pretend as if AI can do that it can never do. Um, and so because of those misses, I think that thinking through ethical AI and bias mitigation, fairness, accountability are going to continue to be a really important area. So for people who are interested in, I think, catching up with what has been done so far and then leading in that space, I think is going to be really, really important. Um, I think um, the third thing, and I sort of already 
mentioned this is personalization and customization. One of the things that really made Google search really, really good was the personalization that they put into it. And I think we're gonna see much more of that. Fine tuning right now is not accessible and it's really hard. And so figuring out how can people who are not machine learning engineers use models that are customized to them and personalized to them without you know, causing additional harms is gonna be a really big trend moving forward. Great. Well, that is super exciting. It's also super scary because that new things to consider as product managers. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, that means that we're going to have to um, maybe may be more tuned into what's happening in the field, um, maybe look a bit more at what academia is, is doing. And that's going to be the, the next topic we're going to touch on, which is relationship between industry and academia. But before we move on, uh, one question, as always in the podcast, from a, a product manager uh, to you, because we were talking about that product uh, manager uh, collaboration and product manager role. So this is a question from Kitaki Vedia, uh, who is an AI product manager at Oracle. So let's hear it. Hello, this is Ketki Vaidya. I'm an AI product manager at Oracle. And today I have a question for Nilofar. So Nilofar, since I've become an AI product manager and it's been one year now into this role, I've heard a lot of people say that in the future, all product managers will become AI product managers. And it's also about how AI will become prevalent in everything that we do and in all the products that we use, which will eventually incorporate AI in some way or the other. So do you think that this whole tag of AI product manager will disappear in the future and that this will become a prerequisite for every product manager job description? That's a really good question. Thank you for asking that. So I think yes and no. Um, I think as these kinds of tools that we use are getting more sophisticated, we are seeing more and more specialization in different kinds of roles and UX roles and programming roles and NPM roles. So I think there will always be a space for the kind of specialization required for managing an AI um, you know, product where AI is at the core. And the reason for that is that um, AI, or sometimes I like to instead use the word statistical pattern rec recognition machines, work very different from the software that we're used to. They're you know, non-deterministic, evaluation is quite different, and uses, and I think the UX for them will develop a lot over the next few years. So having that specialization of understanding how these tools work, how to work with machine learning engineers, how to do evaluation well, how to think about things like bias and privacy. I think that will always be a specialization. At the same time, I think that you're right that more and more of our day-to-day -day tools will incorporate some aspects of these um, kinds of statistical pattern recognition systems. We're already seeing a lot of it. And I think a lot of people aren't exactly aware that Every time you do a Google search, you're using AI. Every time you know you do you put something in a map and, and look at your destination or get a you know or or get a, a song on Spotify, you're always using AI. So I think that we'll see more and more of these AI getting incorporated in a way that is not even really immediately identifiable to its users. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, I think all product managers will need to know the basics um, of what they need to know to be able to manage these types of tools. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay. Well, now I think you've answered lots of questions. So it's my time. <laughs> so it's time for you to ask me a question. What was your question? Yeah. So I want to know what challenges do you think product managers face when they try to incorporate user-centered design into products, especially products that have emerging technologies in them? Well, I think that's a great question. And, um, I've been thinking about the first part of it, like human-centered design. And I think, well, that's the challenge. That's actually the challenge because we can get carried away very quickly uh, by the technology. And I'm, I'm going to mention two, I think. The first one is AI, you know, since uh, ChatGPT has been <laughs> a, a big um, hype. And people have been thinking, okay, what could I do with ChatGPT? You know, starting from the solution. Another example I've seen is if with everything uh, blockchain related is, oh, we've got this very cool technology. What could it do? And I've heard sometimes people talking about um, finding 
a problem to the solution. And I didn't I think that was really a thing. <laughs> I thought, okay, yeah, you know, people not doing proper product management. I think there's a lot of that. And I'm going to include myself sometimes because depending on the company you work with, sometimes you you can't do the actual modern product management. But what I've realized very uh, recently is that it actually takes a lot of energy finding a problem to your solution. Um, so, but, but I'm not quite sure how a product manager can get out of that situation sometimes because who are the companies who want to leverage those innovative technologies? Usually they are like startups, um, you know, companies that can move fast. And in that case, sometimes you have uh, very strong founders who have uh, very strong ideas about where they want to take the business. So how do you, as a product manager, help flip the, the, everything around so that we focus on the user and we focus on the actual problem? And I think that becomes a human problem, i.e., what are the skills that I need as a human to influence people and to get to where I need to go? And that's why when I think about how do we make the product management role future-proof, I see two angles. One is curiosity for the technology and always be looking out at what's coming, um, even like how the markets are evolving. But second, I strongly emphasize on the human side. So all those soft skills um, around building empathy, really active listening uh, that make us human. Because this is where I think, even though we see signs of creativity, some kind of creativity in AI, right? Uh, even though it's, <laughs> it's inspired from what it has learned, uh, I think these are the, the human skills that are going to make a difference in the future if we want to to be you know valuable professionals and and work with AI, not necessarily as equal because I know you raise that as a potential concern, but leverage it as as a tool. Yeah, that's a really that's a really interesting answer. Thank you. <laughs> Great, my turn to be back in the question seat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we touched a bit on that before, um, but I want to dig a bit deeper into the relationship between academia and the industry. Uh, so apart from that experience at ND NVDA, uh, what are the ways that academia and the tech industry can collaborate more effectively together to, to create products? Yeah, so I think one of the major ways that academia and industry already collaborate is that our students end up in industry roles. And so there's that one way flow of information. Um, I think the harder thing is perhaps the opposite of that, getting, you know, under really understanding what the challenges are in industry and academia. Um, and that's a little bit harder because there's sort of in academia, you can get sort of lost in your own problems because you you sort of have the opportunity to decide what problems you want to work on. And so I think it's really important to make sure that you have the opposite as well. As well. Uh, one way that I've worked not only with industry, but just with organizations outside of academia is through longer term collaborations and partnerships. So I've had multi-year partnerships with San Francisco Unified School District, uh, where we're trying to help them figure out how to redesign their student assignment algorithm to better meet the needs of the families in San Francisco. Another is with UCSF, um, the hospital, where which was one of our major partners in looking into machine translation used in healthcare. And so I think that from the academic side, it's really important to have these longer term, or NVIDIA is another example, these longer term partnerships that really allow you, like you were saying, to build that empathy, understanding, build that trust in order to be able to better understand what the problems are and what are the tools of academia that can be useful in solving those problems, not just for that organization, but more broadly. Yeah, I think it's a very good point around partnerships. Um, I remember when I came out of university and then I got my first 
job um, based on the skills I was supposed to have acquired at uni, I realized that there is a huge gap. And I think what you're saying here is, well, we have a responsibility in that because if we professionals who work in the industry don't make an effort to, <laughs> to come to you in academia and to create those partnerships and to exchange, then obviously there's going to be a gap. So we have our roles to play in that. Yeah. So is there something that you can share, like some kind of personal insight, uh, like the most surprising or the most unexpected lesson that you've learned in your career about anything, about, for example, the, the intersection of uh, technology and society or anything you want to share? Yeah, I think this is going to go back really to this what has become sort of the theme of this whole conversation um there's this quote from one of my one of my colleagues Jeff Bigham who's a professor at CMU and he says that the two hardest problem in computer science are one people and two convincing computer scientists that the hardest problem in computer science is people um and i think that's one thing that's sort of a lesson that i i keep going back to in my career is you know like you said, sort of not getting carried away by the technology at the same time as I am fascinated by technology. Um, I've always been, I love programming. I love computers. I love solving problems uh, with them. But, you know, in order for those problems to actually be useful and impactful, I think the hardest problem is really understanding people. I agree. I agree. This is why I kind of look forward to a world with just AI and just robots. We'd get rid of the people <laughs> problem. <laughs> right. Uh, good. So there's a question that a lot of PMs are pondering in their head is now that they see that in the job market, there are... Uh, my by my own estimation, fifty percent of jobs mention AI now, and they're thinking, well, how do I move to AI? Because maybe they're past university already; they're already a professional, or maybe they want to become a product manager, but they didn't study um, data science or anything like this. So, what's your final piece of advice for product managers who want to move to AI? Yeah, so. I've spoken to a lot of product managers who share a lot of anxiety around, oh, you know, my company expects me to manage this AI product and I know nothing about AI. What am I supposed to do? Um, and I will tell you that that is also the case for people who have been in AI for 30 years because the field has changed so much that you're constantly having to learn what is happening now. Generative AI really, in a sense, leveled the playing field in in, in that all of a sudden, a lot of the research that was done on prior machine learning models, that doesn't seem as useful anymore. And, and a lot of the people are starting again from scratch. Okay, how do we make ChatGPT useful? What are the challenges, you know, learning that? My advice would be, first of all, to ignore the hype. Um, I think there's a lot of, you know, just noise that you need to be able to ignore. And one way to do it is perhaps to stop thinking about it as artificial intelligence and, and just think about it as really powerful pattern synthesis engines that might be useful in whatever product that you're managing. Um, my second piece of advice would be to learn about the technology at its core. And I know that that is very intimidating. The people have probably seen this diagram of transformers a million times at this point, and it's really complicated. Um, and it can be, you know, intimidating, but I would just spend a few hours watching videos on YouTube, honestly. Um, I think you'll learn a lot about how the technology is developed will help you a lot in understanding how it can be useful and what it can and cannot do. Because at the core of it, I think that's what the product manager needs to understand. It's not necessarily how the mechanics of a transformer model work, but it's what can this technology do and what can it not do is perhaps as important. Um, and the third is, sort of the theme of this conversation, learn about your users, um, try to really understand what their goals are and what so maybe their hesitations are. Um, there's a lot of work going on right now in my lab and in other places around reliability. And reliability is a very social question. It's not just about, you know, the accuracy of the model. It's about when I'm, you know, 
in the context that I'm going to use this, if I'm a doctor speaking to a patient, what are the potential harms? What are the things that I'm worried about? That's really what reliability is. And then what are ways to mitigate that? Um, and so again, that goes to the core of who are your users? What are they using this for? And what are the challenges that they may have in achieving their goals? Um, so those are my three pieces of advice. I hope that's useful. Yes, I'm I'm sure it would be very useful. And um, when you said, well, there's people who have been assigned almost a, an AI product and they don't know what to do. I would say that's a great thing because I know so many people are trying to move to AI products and well, their, their profile doesn't fit the, the job description, right? So they find it hard to move. So if you have the chance as a product manager to be given the opportunity to work straight away on an AI product, then you know, take it and, and learn from there. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges for people put in that position, though, is having to work with machine learning people for the first time. And it's very different from, you know, working with other programmers that product managers might already be used to. With a programmer, you're like, here's the goal, here's what the specs, go and program it, and it works. With machine learning engineers, it's always statistical. It's like, go build this model. And then you don't really know if it works because you also have to come up with an evaluation benchmark for it. And then it'll always work in some cases and not in other cases. And so there needs to be a lot of understanding about how to how to work with statistical models that work sometimes and not others. And again, that keeps going back to what is the user story? Where is this going to be used? What are likely scenarios? Are my benchmarks actually close to the likely scenarios or not? Great. Well, thank you very much for those pieces of advice. And you know what? I've taken a big break between season one and season two of the podcast. And what I realized starting season two is I forgot to ask my fire questions, but I remembered. And unfortunately, you're the first one I remember it with. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so improv, fire question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to um, uh, propose like two options and you pick one of them. If you want to elaborate, you can. Okay. Okay. Good. AI or human computer interaction? Human computer interaction. Academia or corporate? Academia. San Francisco or Berkeley? Berkeley. <laughs> no, I thought you wanted to Actually, move to San Francisco. Yeah, I want to change my answer there. I do <laughs> want to change my answer. San Francisco. <laughs> Right, it's okay. It doesn't have to be binary. It can be a probabilistic answer as well. <laughs> no, yeah. I think I said Berkeley because I'm in Berkeley right now. But yes, San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> um, in person or remote? In person. ChatGPT or Google Bard? ChatGPT. And finally, book or podcast? Podcast. <laughs> Right. So thank you so much for sharing all of your knowledge and experience with me today. You have um, talked about your survey, you've talked about your research. If people want to carry on the conversation with you, how can they contact you? Yeah, I would love to hear from people. Um, they can contact me on LinkedIn. I'll share my uh, profile with you and also on email. My email is nsalehi at berkeley.edu and I'll, I'll share that with you as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. Thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and colleagues and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. If you have suggestions for topics and guests or any feedback, you can write to Magali Pellissier at hotmail.fr.